welcome to We Never Met, the podcast where I have an interesting stranger on every single week. And today we got... John Gerda. How are you? Pretty good. Yeah. <laughs> An it, interesting stranger. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> One of the interesting strangers. Um, it is scorching today. Yeah, it is. 91. Yeah. yeah. The first, uh, at least, has it been the first over 90? I don't, I think we may hit it once or twice. Okay. Yeah, but maybe not, maybe not here in Bayview, maybe a little bit farther west. Yeah. Um, and so where would people know you from? Mostly. Uh, mostly Milwaukee history. I've been doing it for 47 years, 48 years, something like that. Sure. Uh, books and TV stuff. Yeah. Uh, so that's pretty much what I do. And uh, it's, or at least you said that you kind of got into it by accident. Right. Um, so what is that story? How did you accidentally get into? Uh, very basically, I was an English major in college, went to okay. Boston College and uh, liked poetry and uh, but did not have any interest in going on for an advanced degree. By that time, I felt like I was sort of killing butterflies and pinning them onto boards, you yeah, know, yeah. all that kind of critical analysis stuff. Yeah. Uh, so I came home after graduation in 69. Uh, this is back in the late 60s. And if you weren't part of the solution, you were part of the problem. Mm. Uh, I had a friend who was uh, directing a very, uh, you know, kind of early in his career, Frank Miller, uh, uh, youth center called Journey House on the near south okay. side. And I came down there as a volunteer and ended up staying for three years as a staff member, associate director. Wow. Uh, so it was a really a switch from kind of, you know, kind of being in kind of the English major's head stuff to being kind of in, in an inner city, uh, yeah. you know, youth situation, young people situation. Yeah. And we were a very much a hand to mouth operation and a Vista volunteer and I, a guy named Byron Anderson, decided to write what would be basically kind of a, in some ways, you call it a case statement today, isn't it? Fundraiser, okay. fundraising terms. Sure. Uh, but back then, it was just a narrative about kind of uh, what the neighborhood's needs were and how we were attempting to address them. Uh, sure. So that resulted in a little publication, very primitive, called The Near South Side, A Delicate Balance. Oh, okay. <laughs> and during the research for that, uh, I decided for reasons I don't have any inkling you know what what they what where they came from you sure. know, why i chose that that tack but i chose the historical portion what happened basically is that while i was doing the research for that publication i began to discover sort of connections with my own history which mm. is which is south side you know, yeah. i was raised around jackson park then out in hales corners uh my grandparents had a hardware store on 32nd and lincoln for 50 years okay. so I, I was only you know two miles away you know from the, the my my childhood haunts yeah uh, so I began to see the intersection of my story with the city story, with the uh, sure. nation story, with, with history. And I said before that uh, back in the 60s, it was a time that was pretty much uh, anti-historical. It was always mm. focused on the new, kind of throwing out anything that was over 30, among sure. other things. Sure, sure. Uh, and trying to you know, sort of erect a counterculture. Uh, so it was it was really kind of making a, a 180 and kind of going back to the mm. past as kind of the source of everything in the present and the future. So yeah. in that sense, it was accidental. It was not something that I you know, sat down with a career counselor or you know did sure. a personality test and said you're gonna you, you what well position to be a historian. It was right. just following my nose. And that led to another job with United Way, uh, doing research on a neighbor a little bit farther west on the south side. Okay. And uh, one thing led to another. I uh, went on and got a master's in cultural geography. I uh, did my master's thesis on Jones Island, historical geography mm -hmm. of Jones Island. And you know, that's, that's, that began back in 1971 was the time Delicate Balance came out. So it's been a long time. Yeah. yeah. So what do you think it is specifically about history? Like you said, it kind of... It ties in your own, um, I guess, experience with the experiences of whatever has happened in the city. Mm -hmm. um, but what do you think, uh, what did you want to be before? Like what, before that point hit? Uh, kind of a, a raggedy ass poet. <laughs> you know, no, if, yeah. if, if I had an aspiration, that yeah, would have yeah. been it. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I, I did not have career aspirations when I went to college. You know, okay. I was interested in politics early on. Uh, sure. I was a Goldwater Republican in 1964. Okay. <laughs> around the time of Kennedy, which is a real, uh, just really kind of contrasting optics there. Yeah, uh, yeah. I was sort of attracted to Kennedy, but... Uh, for some reason, I have no idea why. I believe, <laughs> believe in cold water. Uh, that, that, that didn't last all that long. Yeah. Uh, certainly not through high school, uh, or not through not through college. 
Uh, so it, it was not, again, this is the late 60s, which were not, uh, career driven would not be the term to, to describe what was going on back in the 1960s. Sure, sure. And even before that, so you said you grew up here. Right. Um, so what was your childhood like? Like what was growing up like for you here? Uh, it was it was a little cuspy in terms of old and new. Okay. Uh, in my, my earliest memories, first eight years were in the Leighton Park neighborhood. You know, okay. It was kind of an old Polish German neighborhood you know, on the south side. Uh, we were on a street, South 34th Street, with a, a lot of teens and 20s housing, okay. uh, a lot of Poles and Germans. Uh, looking back, I had no idea. Back yeah, yeah, then. sure. Uh, and things had been brought to a standstill by the Depression and World War II. Mm. And my dad bought a little lot on 34th and uh, for $6,000. It was a lot in a little prefab house. Uh, okay. He would later on call them cracker boxes. You know, they, they're, they're still small, that all the, that post-war housing stock. Sure. Uh, but, you know, we, we walked to the hardware store. We walked to the, the branch library, uh, Forest Home Avenue. Uh, you know, we walked to Jackson Park, you know, which is just a, a great green space. So, so in that sense, it was kind of uh, an older Milwaukee. Uh, when mm. I was eight, we moved to Hills Corners to a former cow pasture uh, okay. on Brookside Drive. And that was very typical 1950s, 60s suburban. Okay. Uh, the kind of thing you would have, uh, with, with, with the, the leave it to beaver and the, the, sure, the, sure. the top 40, you know, kind of the, the, the same culture. You know, yeah. Americans would have uh, been absorbed in from California to Rhode Island. Yeah. Did you enjoy that? Like, did you enjoy that upbringing? And like, like looking back now, I mean, obviously when you were there, you didn't really have a choice, Yeah. you know? Right, right. Uh, yeah. But, you're like, like a fish in the goldfish bowl saying, yeah. am I having fun yet? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, but looking back, did you, was that something that you enjoyed or would, would you have chosen if you could, I guess, some, some other sort of. Uh, I think I enjoyed it, and, and part of the you know I, I I like having that connection with the old Milwaukee, you mm. know, because that informs a lot of what I what I've been doing ever since. Right. Uh, I also like the uh, in Hills Corners, the open spaces of Whitnell Park, and being able to get in the bike and go wherever we pleased. Yeah. Uh, playing baseball just about every single day in the summer in vacant lots. Yeah. You know, and that was, that was that was a nice way to grow up. Uh, what it lacked uh, was diversity. You know, mm -hmm. I didn't know any black people until college, and, okay. and then barely. Uh, yeah. So it really was very much a uh, a European you know, kind of a, a background uh, sure. that, that I was raised with. And specifically in my case, uh, you know, my family's Polish on my dad's side, and that was, you know, that was uh, the hardware store. I'm liking that. That, that was a real kind of a. Uh, a landmark touchstone you know, mm -hmm. for everybody in my family. Yeah. Uh, and my mother was from a uh, dairy farm in southwestern Wisconsin. Okay. She, so she was Norwegian. Uh, her, her dad's name was John Johnson. Uh, and in the town of La Crosse, around a little town called Coon Valley. Uh, so I had a had a, a sense of connection through them with things that were that were older, uh, but it was not diverse, and it was also uh, you know being raised reflexively Catholic, you know, mm -hmm. which is kind of the, very much the Polish. My mom converted, you know, when okay. uh, she got married. They met, met during World War II, uh, and the, the Catholic Church in those pre-Vatican days was uh, pretty high-bound, doctrinaire rigid. Uh, I mean, there's a lot going on. Not all of it's savory uh, beneath the surface. Mm -hmm. uh, at the same time, you know, there was an expectation of uh, living a life with meaning, sure. uh, living a life that had some aspect of service, you know, mm -hmm. and those, those, those have stayed with me. So it's, it's, it's life, you know, it's kind of, yeah. it's always kind of darkness and light. Yeah. Yeah. Did your parents come here from somewhere? Um, or no, were they born no, in my dad was, too? my dad was born in this, my dad was born above the hardware store. Oh, uh, okay. So he was born there back in 1911. Uh, my mom was raised in you know, her, her both. Her dad was born in Norway, came as a kid. Uh, my dad's dad was born in Poland, came as a kid. So, so I'm third generation. Okay. Yeah. So I guess spending most of your life in Wisconsin, um, you got to see, in Milwaukee specifically, you got to see kind of it change a lot, I'm sure. sure. Yep. Um, was there a specific time period for you that you enjoyed the most in Milwaukee, like seeing the city specifically? You know, part of it is that uh, you you remember and value things in terms of where you are, in terms of your, your mm -hmm. age. You know? yeah. So the 50s were, in a lot of ways, that was a fairly, uh, re re looking back retroactively, this was a fairly carefree time. You mm -hmm. know, the, the, certainly we had the, the, the threat of the bomb, uh, mm -hmm. you know, the 
fallout shelters were kind of in the news, Cuban Missile Crisis. Sure. Uh, but there was still, there was an innocence to that time, you know, yeah. that uh, we've since lost. Uh, in terms of, you know, a time in Milwaukee's uh, history, during my lifetime, you know, the, just seeing the, the multiple renaissances downtown has been kind of fun, mm -hmm. you know, kind of see that being made, remade, remade again. Sure. <laughs> it's, it's just remarkable. Remember, there was, back in the 80s, there was a big burst of development then, and somebody in Milwaukee Magazine said, uh, no, now Milwaukee's downtown's finally done. <laughs> No, yeah, no, 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 cities, yeah. cities are never, never, ever done. Yeah. Uh, and I've also, I think after the sixties and I was, I was part of that kind of that movement. Uh, there was that, uh, a disavowal of the past, uh, an yeah, embrace what do you of mean, the what, new. What do you mean by that? In the years before the sixties, yeah. you know, uh, or in, in the sixties, it, it worked both ways for, for my parents' generation. A lot of it was, uh, kind of turning your back on the city and moving to the suburbs. That's where the past, the grass was greener. Sure. Know? So that was a disavowal of, you know, what they felt to be back then, you know, kind of these, these out of date neighborhoods, you no, know, mm. that had not been uh, seen a lot of reinvestment because of the depression of world war two, 15 years. I mean, no mm. one's building, no one's fixing up. Yeah. Uh, and then my generation, you know, kind of did it even took that even further and kind of rejected the whole cultural heritage of the Western world. <laughs> so, uh, I mean, it was fairly a fairly broad, you know, kind of a, a, a retreat. Uh, so seeing in more of the, it's more of the seventies and the sixties, seeing kind of a, the rediscovery of ethnicity, mm. uh, the historic preservation movement, mm. uh, the, the, the revaluing of old neighborhoods. So yeah. that, that's, that's been, that's been very positive. Yeah. Uh, I'd love to see that. Yeah. So do you think since you've, you know, you've been here for such a, a long time, do you think Milwaukee, like the culture and growing up here has shaped you in a certain way? Oh, sure. sure. Um, yeah, absolutely. How do you think it has like specifically in terms of specific Milwaukee kind of values? Uh, and I, I, I drink beer, you know, I don't, mm -hmm. don't drink cocktails. Uh, I, I like to spend time outdoors, you know, the park system here, you know, gives you yeah. a, a great opportunity to, to do just that. Uh, sometimes Milwaukeeans are criticized for looking at our feet too much, you know, kind of, mm. uh, especially in, in contrast to Chicago. Uh, but in, in my point, from my point of view, that gives Milwaukee a groundedness, you mm. know, I mean, no, nobody puts on airs, you know, in Milwaukee. It's pretty, yeah. it's, it's pretty much, a, uh, what you see is what you get kind right. of town. I mean, not a lot of posing, not a lot of posturing. Mm. And I, I, I like that authenticity. Yeah. You know, always have. And I, I think I'm, I'm a product of that as well. Yeah. So, um, and then from this kind of love of history and, and you started writing books. So when you first, what was the first book you wrote when you kind of decided that you wanted to go down like a writing and more historical route? Uh, it, I had no aspirations to write books. Like again, I was just following my nose, mm -hmm. you know, that, that like a bounce came out in 71. Uh, I did a couple of, uh, projects for United Way, uh, did, did a really, really crappy book about Waukesha County for United Way. Why was it crappy? It was just awful. It was just terrible. You know, it was sad. It was <laughs> primitive research, uh, sort of obvious conclusions. Mm. Uh, and that's when I realized that, as I said, uh, you know, Milwaukee Magazine you know, did a, a story a while back. I said, I realized I did not know my ass from my elbow. <laughs> and and that, 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 that was true. That was absolutely true. So I went back and got a master's in 78. Uh, and then after that, I got hired by uh, a, a program at EWM funded by the National Endowment for the Humanities. Mm -hmm. And part of the program was to develop an encyclopedia of Milwaukee neighborhoods. Okay. And that's kind of what I was doing. So that was kind of my charge you yeah. know, in that project. And back in 1979, wrote a book called Bayview, Wisconsin. Uh, mm -hmm. and followed that with a book called The West End in 1980, which was about Pigsville, Merrill Park, and Concordia up on the near west side, okay. around 35th in Wisconsin. And those those were the first real books, uh, not long, 100, 125 pages, uh, but uh, the first kind of sustained mm -hmm. uh, effort, you know, for, for me. And that's, the that Bayview book sold about 5,000 copies. Wow. You know, it's been out of print for a long time. Grappi's Market sold about 1,000. So, oh, really? So it was... It was very grassroots and very intentionally. You know, yeah. it was uh, it was just filled with quotes from interviews, and and the quotes were all in bold. You know, so that was that was quite on purpose, yeah. giving the community a voice. Yeah. Um, so, 
what has been a neighborhood that you really enjoy covering? What is they're, they're all interesting. Uh, you know, it's like it's like studying people. You know, everybody, yeah. everybody has his or her own and, story. Yep. Yeah. Uh, but Bayview is my favorite neighborhood. I mean, I've been here since 1978. You know, yeah. So it's and it's kind of the uh, I describe Bayview as a part of the city, apart from the city. You mm-hmm. know, it's got its own history. You know, it was once a company town. It was once a suburb. Uh, and it still has a strong sense of, of place built around that iron mill that used to stand at the south end of the Danholm Bridge, you know, from 1868 to 1929. Uh, and it has, you know, this kind of a sort of a laid back vibe. You know, mm-hmm. it's, it's I've described Bayview as the south side's east side. Okay. You know, it's both physically and culturally. So that's, yeah, they'll drag me out of here feet first. You know, but, but there, there's a lot of, I mean, Milwaukee is a lot of, a lot of sound and interesting neighborhoods. What is the sort of, I guess, we, we, you probably go on forever about it, but like what is the sort of abridged history of Bayview? 1868, uh, an iron mill was located here, mm-hmm. uh, and it made railroad rails. Okay. Uh, the, the second largest maker of railroad rails in the country. Had about 1,500 workers uh, in the 1870s, and wow. uh, it was beyond the the edge of settlement in Milwaukee because it needed so much space, and they also mm. wanted to control kind of their own affairs. Uh, so they incorporated as a, as the village of Bayview back in 1879. Okay. And by the next few years, Milwaukee kind of grew out to meet the the suburb. And in 1887, Bayviewites voted to consolidate with Milwaukee. Okay. So it's been a neighborhood you know, ever since 1887. Okay, uh, but I, as I said many times, it was like getting married and keeping your name. You know, the, okay. the, this is still Bayview. You know, yeah, yeah, very much Bayview. Yeah, and so I guess over over the course of all these, you wrote a book that um, eventually got turned into a TV show. Yeah, the Making of Milwaukee. Yeah, and it won an Emmy. Right. So what was the what was the process of was that the first ever adaptation into other media's? That you yeah had? I I'd done some script work for Channel Ten from okay. Milwaukee PBS sure. uh, but that was by far the largest uh, and where that came from was the, the making of Milwaukee the book came out in 1999 mm-hmm. and that was by that time I've been writing pretty much I, be, I began to work on that back in about 95 uh, so it had been 20 years by that time almost I'd done a, a number of commissioned works uh, some corporations some mm-hmm. churches. Uh, uh, Forest Home Cemetery, you know, oh. so, so so interesting assignments, and that's yeah. that's been really important, you know. Yeah. To I, I, I would not have been able to support myself or my family, you know, if I'd sure. been strictly, you know, grant work and uh, sort of nonprofit stuff, kind of hoping, you know, for sales on the other end. So sure. so done a number of commissions, and what I felt was, you know, I kind of I'd assembled enough pieces of the puzzle that I felt almost an obligation to sort of finish it yeah uh, and I thought it'd be pretty easy it, it was not it, oh. it, it was really hard because I had to you know, what I did was I kind of uh, assigned myself uh, the task of telling Milwaukee's story from the beginning to you know, then yeah you know, back in 99 when it right. came out so that was four years of work you know that was that was just about all I did yeah uh, for four years and that came out and it was what it did uh and a lot of it was that there was a vacuum uh in the, the market you know there had not been a good not even using the word good but a relatively complete mm. history of milwaukee since 1948. oh wow so so there really was you know kind of a, a gap and that right. was that was a really good book baird stills uh, milwaukee the history of a city but it was very long and sort of tough sledding uh okay. you know, good book but not something the general reader would pick up yeah and and not many pictures either uh so what that what the book did is it became kind of the uh, if only by default the standard the general history of milwaukee sure. you know since then now it's in, it's in the fourth edition uh we yeah. have the last update in in december uh okay. 2018 uh, and it sold about it's up to about twenty eight thousand copies you wow. know which is uh Doing pretty well yeah. for a local title, uh, and and I knew uh, even before the book was completely you know done and being accepted that, mm. I, that I needed to tell this story uh, in a way that was more more broadly accessible than print. Sure. Uh, so Channel Ten was uh, enthusiastic about it, uh, went out and raised the money, and that took another <laughs> close to four years. 
uh, working with a woman named Claudia Luz, uh, lived in Bayview at the time, and just just a real, a very gifted uh, director, editor, mm-hmm. uh, producer, uh, and the, the crew, uh, Channel 10. And that came out in 2006 and won an Emmy the next year. It's five hours. It's a five-hour series. Yeah. Uh, we updated that, added a half hour. Uh, we'll update in 2016, the 10th year, 10-year anniversary. And they still, this still has has some legs, you know. They yeah. they still pledge that, you know. They put, put that on pledge drives and use it in the schools. So that's been uh, it's been gratifying. And it's it's and it's still a lot of what really makes that show work. Uh, we had a a, a through written soundtrack uh, written by Maurice Winenski, mm. who's a bassist for the Milwaukee Symphony, and just seamless, you know, just yeah. just hand and glove, you know, just it really really made that piece sing. Yeah. What do you think it is now? I guess maybe this is just my personal experience too, but like I am very, very fascinated in, for example, we're in a house right now, like what this looked like a hundred years ago or 200 years ago or what was here. Mm -hmm. Um, Where do you think that comes from in people? I think the historical imagination has always been a facet of being human. Yeah. Uh, I think people thousands millennia you know uh, ago or kind of looking back the way things had been mm-hmm. uh is it's we're not here for that long yeah and you kind of just as you're curious about the future you know kind of what our generations you know like what my granddaughter in the backyard you know right. what, she, what she's going to experience you know as as a an older adult uh you know that, that, that's fascinating you also look back and just the contrast, you know, the, the pace of change has been so fast, right? Uh, especially yeah. in the more more recent decades, uh, you know, it's 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 fascinating to try to time travel and kind of go back to, you know, try to uh, at, at least imagine kind of what life was like. But yeah. the more the more important thing for me, uh, and I think it's it's another part of that historical imagination, uh, is I've used this line time and again, but history is why things are the way they are. Mm-hmm. You know, so you really can't understand, you know, kind of uh, where Bayview or Milwaukee or the world is in 2019 without having some notion of where it's been. You know, yeah. otherwise you're suffering from amnesia. Yeah. 